In this video, we'll review Chapter 31, American Life in the Roaring Twenties. 1920 to 19 or 1920 to 1929 the red scare happened during this time period following the bolshevik revolution in 1919 which was the coming of communism to russia the effects on the united states it caused the small communist party to emerge which was blamed for some of the labor strikes in seattle in 1919 the big red scare of 1919 to 1920 was a nationwide crusade began a nationwide crusade against left-wingers whose Americanism was suspect. Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer saw red too easily. The Fighting Quaker, as he was called, rounded up to 6,000 suspects, and the number doubled in June 1919 when a bomb shattered both the nerves and the home of Palmer. Other events that highlighted the Red Scare were, in December 1919, a shipload of 249 alleged alien radicals de were deported on the Buford, which was the Soviet Ark, to Russia. In September 1920, the still unexplained bomb blast on Wall Street killed 38 people and wounded 100 others. State legislatures from 1919 to 1920 joined the outcry and passed criminal syndicism, syndic syndicalism laws. Which, meant anti -red, which were anti-red statutes that made unlawful mere advocacy of violence to secure social change. Critics protested that mere words were not criminal deeds, but the violence had been done to freedom of speech as the IWW members and other radicals vigorously were vigorously prosecuted. This is the bomb blast on Wall Street, September 1920, the target of this terrorist attack seemed to be the offices of J.P. Morgan, but no person or group ever claimed responsibility for the blast, and the victims were random financial district employees, not moguls of Wall Street. In 1920, five New York state legislators, all lawfully elected, were denied seats because they were socialists. Conservatives used the Red Scare to break the fledgling unions. Unions called for closed or all-union shops, and this was denounced as Sovietism in disguise. Employers hailed their anti-union campaign for open shop as the American plan. This anti-redism and anti-foreignism was reflected in a notorious case regarded by liberals as a judicial lynching. Nicola Sacco and Bartolomeo Vanzetti were convicted in 1921 of murder of a Massachusetts paymaster and his guard. The jury and the judge were prejudiced against, all, against the defenders because they were Italians, atheists, anarchists, and draft dodgers. The liberals and radicals the world over rallied to their defense, and the case dragged on for over six years until in 1917 when the condemned men were actually electrocuted. The communists and radicals had two martyrs now in their class struggle. The new KKK makes its appearance during this time period, and this resembled anti-foreign nativist movements of the 1850s rather than the anti-black night riders of the 1860s. These anti-foreign, anti-Catholic, anti-black, anti-Jewish, anti-pacifist, anti-communist, anti-internationalist, anti-evolutionist, anti-bootlegger, anti-gambling, anti-adultery, and anti-birth control group was pro-Anglo-Saxon, pro-native, American, and pro-Protestant. The Klan betokened extremists, ultra-conservatives, and caused an uprising against forces of diversity and modernity, transforming American culture during the time period. It spread rapidly in the Midwest and the Bible Belt South, where Protestant fundamentalism thrived. In the mid-1920s, at its peak, it had five million dues-paying members and wielded a potent political influence. The Knights of the Invisible Empire, as they were called, included among the officials Imperial Wizards, Grand Goblins, King Kleagles, and other horrendous creatures. The things of the KKK, they had impressive conclaves, which were huge uh, flag-waving parades. They had, their chief warning was the Blazing Cross. Their principal weapon was the bloodied lash, supplemented by tarring and feathering. And they also had rally songs and a brutal slogan. This is a picture of Klan's women on parade in 1928, which showed that women members here were unmasked and unapologetic and marching down Pennsylvania Avenue under the shadow of the Capitol Dome. They collapsed in the late 1920s in part because of corruption, not because of anything that the federal government tried to do to hold them down. There was a $10 initiation fee, 
which $4 of it was a kickback to local organizations as an incentive to recruit. The KKK was a manifestation of intolerance and prejudice against the pace of social change in the 1920s. The civil rights activists fought in vain for legislation which made lynching a federal crime. Also, as a result of all the foreign immigrants coming into the, the country, isolationist America in the 1920s will grow. And they had people who were ingrown and provincial during, the, during this time period had little use for immigrants. 800,000 were coming in from 1820 to 1821. Two-thirds of them were from Southern and Eastern Europe. These Americans recoiled at what they called the new immigrants coming from these areas. Congress passed an Emergency Quota Act in 1921, and the newcomers from Europe were restricted to a quota. The Immigration Act of 1924 was passed to replace the Emergency Act. The quota was cut from 3% to 2%, but national origins base shifted from the census of 1910 to the 1890 census. That meant that Southern Europeans were bitterly denounced as discriminatory. Southern Europeans denounced this as discriminatory. The purpose was to freeze America's existing racial composition, which was largely Northern Europeans. It slammed the door absolutely against Japanese immigrants, and Hate America rallies erupted in Japan. Exempt from the quota system were Canadians and Latin Americans. They were easy to attract for jobs when times were good and easy to send home when times were bad. This affected a pivotal departure in American policy. This claimed the nation, uh, people claimed the nation was filling up and the no vacancy sign was being, was being now ha um, posted. By 1931, there were more foreigners had left than arrived into the United States. This is a political cartoon called The Only Way to Handle It, showing isolationists and nativists who were succeeding in damming up the flow of immigrants to the United States in the early 1920s. The Immigration Act of 1924 placed the strict quotas on European immigrants and completely shut out the Japanese. And that is reflected in this political cartoon. Quotas caused America to sacrifice some of its tradition of freedom and opportunity, as well as its future economic ethnic diversity. The Immigration Act of 1924 marked the end of an era. Virtually unrestricted immigration had brought some 35 million newcomers, mostly from Europe, but the immigrant tide was now cut off, and left on American shores were a patchwork of ethnic communities separated by language, religion, and customs. Cultural plurists opposed the immigration restriction because they celebrated ethnic identity and cultural cross-fertilization. This is a, a figure that shows annual immigration and the quota laws, showing the national origins quota system that was abolished in 1965. Prohibition, the prohibition experiment, was next on the agenda, and prohibition was the last cause of the progressive reform movement. The 18th Amendment was authorized um, in 1919 and, and basically put prohibition into place and made alcohol illegal. The implement, it was implemented by the Volstead Act, which was passed by Congress in 1919, which made the world safe for hypocr hypocrisy. The legal abolition of alcohol especially was popular in the South and West. No More Moonshine is the title of this picture, showing federal agents gloating over a captured still in Daytona, Ohio, in 1930. In the West, prohibition was an attack on vices associated with Western saloons and public drunkenness and prostitution. There was strong opposition to the Dry Amendment in the larger eastern cities, especially for the wet foreign-born people, and sociability was built around drinking, so most Americans assumed that prohibition had come to stay. But prohibitionists were very naive. They overlooked the tenacious American tradition of the strong drink and overlooked weak control by the central government, especially over private lives. This is a picture titled A Polish Child Laboring Among Men, showing an image of workers at an Illinois class company factory in Alton, Illinois. 
This is a picture titled Solidarity, Solidarity Still, and, um, taken in 1981, showing that many Polish Americans continue to take a keen interest in the fate of their ancestral lands, which is an interest that most immigrants of the United States during this time period had. The federal government had never satisfactorily enforced a law that the majority of people or strong minority rejected, and so prohibition was the first one to do this. The lawmakers could not legislate away the thirst. So peculiar conditions hampered enforcement. The wisdom of further self-denial after the war, the slaking thirst became cherished, became a cherished personal liberty. The wets believed the way to repeal it was to violate the law on a large scale. And soldiers complained that prohibition put, uh, was put over on them while they were over there. Workers bemoaned the loss of cheap beer. Flaming youth thought it smart to swill bootleg liquor and, and liquor, and millions of older citizens found the forbidden fruit fascinating as they engaged in bar hunts. This might have been more successful if there had been a large army of enforcement officials, but the federal agencies were understaffed and underpaid snoopers were susceptible to bribery. Prohibition simply did not prohibit. Men only corner saloons were replaced by speakeasies. The hard liquor drunk by men and women continued, and the zeal of American prohibition agents strained relations with Canada. The worst of the homemade vodka produced blindness and even death, and bootleggers worked in partnership with the undertaker. Yet the noble experiment was not entirely a failure. Bank savings of people increased during this time period, as absenteeism from work in industry decreased, death from alcoholism and cirrhosis declined, and less alcohol was consumed than in the days before Prohibition. Prohibition spawned shocking crimes in the golden age of gangsterism. Profits of illegal alcohol led to bribery of the police and violent wars in big cities between rival gangs. Rival triggermen erased bootlegging competitors, and in Chicago in the 1920s there were 500 mobsters that were murdered over prohibition. Arrests were few and convictions even fewer. Chicago was the most spectacular example of lawlessness. In 1925, Scarface, named Al Capone, began six years of gang warfare. He zoomed through the streets in armor-plated cars with bulletproof windows. This is a picture of the gangster Al Capone fishing in Florida. Basically, Al Capone wasn't convicted or wasn't caught and convicted and sent to jail for prohibition. He was caught and finally jailed in 1932 for falsifying his income tax returns. Public enemy number one, who was Al Capone, could not be convicted of the massacre on St. Valentine's Day in 1929 of seven unarmed members of a rival gang. And after serving 11 years for income tax evasion, he was released as a wreck. Gangsters moved into other profitable and illicit activities, such as prostitution, gambling, and narcotics. Honest merchants were forced to pay protection money, and racketeers invaded the ranks of local labor unions as organizers and promoters. Organized crime began to be one of the nation's biggest businesses. By 1930, the annual take of the underworld was 12, went from 12 to $18 billion. Criminal callousness sank to new depths in 1923, when kidnapping for ransom and eventual murder of the infant son of aviator hero Charles Lindbergh took place. Congress passed the Lindbergh Law, making interstate abduction in certain circumstances a death penalty offense. Monkey business in Tennessee had to do with science, the collision of science and education and religion. Many educational strides were taken in the 1920s, and more states required students to remain in school until the age of 16 or 18 or until graduation. And in this time, high school graduation rates doubled in the 1920s. There was a change in the educational theory proposed by John Dewey. The principles of learning by doing, which meant so-called progressive education with its greater permissiveness, they believed that the workbench was as essential as the blackboard and that education for life should be the primary goal of the teacher. Science made advancements during this time period. Health programs launched by the Rockefeller Foundation in the South in 1909 wiped out hookworm by the 1920s. Better nutrition and health care increased the life expectancy of newborns from 50 years in 1901 to 59 years in 1929. Science and progressive education faced unfriendly fire 
of the newly organized fundamentalists, they who made numerous attempts to make secure laws prohibiting the teaching of evolution. In Tennessee, the heart of the so-called Bible Belt South, the spirit of evangelical religion was very robust, which leads to the monkey trial. So in 1825, a Dayton High School biology teacher named John T. Scopes was indicted for teaching evolution. He was defended by a nationally renowned attorneys. William Jennings Bryan was made to appear very foolish by the famed criminal lawyer Clarence Darrow. Five days after the trial, Bryan died of a stroke. This is a picture showing the battle over evolution, showing the opponents of Darwin's theory who set up shop at the opening of the, of the famed monkey trial in Dayton, Tennessee in 1925. This trial was an early battle in an American culture war that still exists today over evolution versus creation. The historic clash between theology and biology proved inconclusive. Scopes was found guilty and fined $100. Tennessee Supreme Court upheld the law but set aside the fine on a technicality. So the fundamentalists really won a hollow victory here. Fundamentalism was the emphasis on the literal reading of the Bible. They remained a vibrant force in American spiritual life, and they remained strong in the Baptist Church and rapidly growing Churches of Christ, organized in 1906.